Thank you very much. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, we are delighted to be here to talk about scaling batch AI uh, workload beyond the Kubernetes scheduler. So a quick introduction. My name is Antena Stefanuti, and I'm a software engineer at Red Hat, where I work on OpenShift AI, specifically focusing on the resource management for model training. Hi, everyone. My name is Anish Astana, and I'm an engineering manager I'm on the same team as Antena, I'm focused very much on resource management and distributed workloads. So for today's agenda, we'll start by briefly talking about the key uh, characteristics that differentiate offline job from online services. We'll then take an example and see how those characteristics, some of them, uh, make it challenging to uh, scale the execution of bad job on Kubernetes using the default Kubernetes scheduler. We'll then move on to review the different classes of uh, project batch scheduler project that have emerged in the ecosystem and that aim at solving those challenges. And then we'll, we'll go over briefly in more detail some of these projects. So to, um, to start, the, and it's important for the discussion that we, we are going to be having in, in that presentation, uh, just quickly see what differentiate offline jobs from online services that we know Kubernetes is good at orchestrating well. Um, so a typical example of an online service is a web application, a, a microservices kind of uh, architecture or serverless application. So these are mostly stateless application where the replicas are homogeneous. They are like the same um, uh, kind of workload um, that are disposable. And generally the um, processing unit is the request and it goes to being processed by a thread or a routine. And as a platform administrator, the uh, KPI or the SLI that you're really interested in is the latency and the availability of your platform. Um, and from a compute, um, when it comes to sizing the, the cluster, from a compute standpoint, you would take like the expected load model from, let's say, your production environment, and it would be fairly easy job to, um, to size the cluster accordingly to the load that's expected. And, and the, the viability of the load would be fairly limited, which uh, leads that generally um, the way you would adapt to the viability of your load it, it is to auto-scale at the pod level. So on the other end, offline jobs, bad jobs, such as like a, a IML distributed model training or a Spark um, job or a Ray job, for example, um, these are mostly stateful applications that are made of like heterogeneous replicas. The prime example being like you have a, a driver um, um, process or let's say a leader that is responsible for coordinating multiple workers. Um, the processing unit is more like the worker uh, that is going to uh, process data partitions or data shards that are allocated to each uh, worker. Um, and from an administrator standpoint, you're more interested in uh, maximizing the throughput of uh, your platform and also the efficiency or optimize the usage of your resource or of your platform is. Um, and when it comes to sizing the, the cluster, it's a bit more difficult because the, the activity of your user, they directly translate to a high viability of um, loads. You can live like peak uh, usage where uh, lots of jobs get um, submitted. And generally that means that when you want to really adapt, be capable of adapting to that um, magnitude of variability in the world, you would really um, auto scale at the node level, at the cluster level. So uh, when it comes to highlighting, what are the key challenges when it comes to scaling batch job scheduling on the Kubernetes scheduler, uh, with the Kubernetes scheduler, we've uh, taken a, a fairly simple example. So uh, scheduling a, a, a thousand batch job, um, each of them having 10 parallel pods, a simulating like a completion duration between three minutes and five, li five minutes, around five minutes. Um, the key constraint being that all the pods have to be ready uh, so the entire job can start pro its progression. So that, that kind of like is the constraint that you have when you, you do like distributed model training. The, all your worker pod, they have to be online and the leader as well so um, the training can progress. 
And we set a completion deadline to 15 minutes. So that means that when the deadline exceeds, all the, um, the, all the pods for that jobs get terminated and the, the jobs get um, terminated as well. We schedule those jobs on a Android node. We, we've been using Quark to simulate the node. So Quark is a, a very good like project to um, ease performance uh, testing for contemporary components, and, and you don't have to have like real physical server to do that. Um, so given all the parameters there, the um, a total request, uh, resource request for the jobs, what's available for, uh, from these um, Android nodes, um, and the um, average duration time for the job, it, it gives us like the theoretical maximum throughput for the platform, for, for the, the execution of those uh, jobs, which is around roughly 8,000 jobs um, completed in 10 minutes. So that's kind of the key um, performance indicator that um, we would expect to be um, provided by the Kubernetes scheduler. So here is the result of running that um, simple example uh, with the uh, Kubernetes, the default Kubernetes scheduler. And we see, so here we see that um, a, a large percentage of the, the job fails. Um, and, and so we see that quickly as the jobs get, get created, um, they saturate the, they saturate the uh, available compute resource uh, provided by the nodes. Um, and there is simple, simply not enough like bandwidth for um, all the job to complete within um, their, um, before their completion deadline uh, exceed. So as the uh, job saturates the available compute resources, we see that uh, there is an increasing number there of scheduling attempts that fails. And it takes an increasing number of attempts to get um, but successfully scheduled. And similarly, it takes an increasing amount of time for a single pod to be successfully scheduled uh, on the platform. Another interesting aspect also is that with that simple test, we see that uh, it also impacts the scheduling of uh, other kind of workload lines. Some of those that could be scheduled beside the test job, the uh, average scheduling time is, uh, for, for the pod that have the same priority is impacted. On the other end, it's still the, the Kubernetes scheduler still does um, a fairly good job for the higher priority uh, pod. Um, so we are, we are not going too much into the details today of how the Kubernetes scheduler works. It's more for uh, people interested. If you want to really get deep into how the Kubernetes scheduler works, there is a good resource in the SIG uh, scheduling project uh, that explains exactly how the uh, Kubernetes scheduler works. Um, so. Uh, with that example, um, that limited bandwidth that the system provides, it could be mitigated by increasing the uh, completion deadline that we've set. But there is a major, a, a more um, problematic issue, which is re resource fragmentation. Um, so here, what we did, like, we increased the parallelism of the job that we scheduled. So instead of having a thousand job with it, each 10 pods, we only have a hundred um, Pod, but this time they have like um, Android pods each. So we, we still uh, have the same uh, amount of uh, computer requests. It's just that they are distributed differently. And we see that by increasing parallelism, um, the failure rate also increases. So we, we, we started with 51% of failed job and now we have 81. Um, and the reason is that the Kubernetes uh, scheduler have I have no idea of um, the constraint that there is that the, all the pods for a single job have to be scheduled um, atomically um, as, as a group. So basically what happens is that we end up with uh, many jobs that are scheduled partially and it ends up in a, in a kind of a deadlock situation. And no, mar no matter how much extra time we give to the system to, to um, to work, we, we, here in, we, we've rerun the test and we, instead of having a deadline of set to, to 15 minutes, it's set, it's, it's set to one hour and, and, and it does not any good. We, we still have a fairly very high level of failure. And, and we see here that the, the Kubernetes scheduler just struggle and, and at each uh, scheduling cycle it retries, but there is no chances that 
um, by chance, it scheduled the entire set of uh, pods for a single job. So that, that problem is, um, um, is supposed to be solved by um, a plugin, a kube scheduler plugin that's called the, the co-scheduling plugin. Um, so what it does is like it extends at some extension point the default Kubernetes scheduler and it sorts um, all the pods in the scheduling queue continuously for, for each job so that they are continuously scheduled and it makes sure that um, it only binds um, the entire set of pods for a single job when um, there is enough resources and that the, the entire set of pods can actually be scheduled. So here we've rerun the test using the, by enabling the code scheduling scheduler plugin. So one, one uh, thing for us to mention is that like it, 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 it does a very good job, like the, the, um, the entire uh, set of jobs, or the, um, the 100 um, jobs, they successfully complete. Uh, then the major uh, thing to mention is that it, it takes a very long time for um, all the job to complete. And it, it, it's much higher than the expected theoretical maximum throughput we had like uh, computed before. It's almost a order of magnitude uh, larger than longer than um, than the 10 minute theoretical maximum throughput. Um, and the reason is that probably for each um, scheduling cycle here, it operates on the entire set of pods. So it's, it's, it's at, at each scheduling cycle, it's going to sort the 10,000 pods and it, it really leads to an, a significant increase in the, um, basically the, the, the scheduling items um, average uh, time. Another maybe quick thing, things to mention is that it does a, a good job also at not impacting the other um, kind of workload that can be scheduled. So any schedulable pods, with default priority or even higher priority is not affected by that. Um, and here is just an example, at running the uh, example where we have a, a thousand um, batch job, but this time we use a, those um, job scheduler or queue manager project. So for instance, here it's using queue. So we run the exact same test. And here we see that um, with such a project for in, for in that example, queue, it's throttled the execution of the jobs here. And it makes sure that it does a very good job at maximizing the, uh, at optimizing the, the available resource usage. And it's also very efficient at, um, um, at, at executing all these, these, these jobs. And here the um, total completion time is 15 minutes, which is very close to um, the maximal theoretical throughput. We also see that um, almost all the pods get successfully scheduled in one attempt here. Same here for the average duration, it's, it's very nominal. And by doing that, it's, it really relieves the um, scheduler, the default Kubernetes scheduler activity. Um, here we see that it's an order of magnitude lower in the number of scheduling attempts. And same here for the other kind of workload pods. They are not affected by um, whatever we do for testing there. It's very um, low nominal average uh, scheduling time. And, and uh, last but not least, just the example where we increased the parallelism here, still with Q. Um, so 100 uh, job with 100 pods. And, and it does not like um, make any difference because Q operates at the, the job level. So no matter how distributed the, the job is, it's still able to um, do a, a very good job at maximizing the uh, resource usage and also same, the um, completion, um, the, the throughput is very close to what would be an optimal throughput. So now that we've seen um, uh, basically the, the challenges that uh, comes with the default Kubernetes scheduler and an example here of uh, using a, um, a queue manager so as queue, uh, I'll hand over to Anish that is going to talk a bit more about those kind of uh, projects. All right. Um, yeah. So, like I said, like he's given us a lot of the motivation for why you would want some sort of job scheduler. Um, we can talk through some of the options we have now. Um, first up, you have your custom schedulers and you have your queue managers. Um, custom schedulers, 
replace or extend the Kubernetes scheduler. Um, but the end result kind of ends up being the same thing. You are changing how scheduling works for your cluster. Um, they operate at the pod level for the most part. Um, and they're responsible for both queuing like, and admission of jobs as well as your scheduling. Um, great in practice, right? Um, the only downside is that there is a pretty big impact in that you are changing the default scheduler for your cluster. Queue managers are, it's in the name, they are solely responsible for queuing and admission of your workloads. Um, they usually operate at a higher level on some CRDs, so it could be like your jobs, PyTorch, jobs, whatever. And um, they're pretty lightweight. You usually just get a controller, or maybe some CRDs for configuration. Um, in our case, for OpenShift AI, like we had um, queuing requirements pop up as Antonov motivated it. And um, we, lent, we were leaning more towards queue managers, again, just due to the fact that there's less possible impact on customer clusters, right? Like we are asking you to install a custom scheduler on your cluster, it's going to be a little challenging. Next up, I'm gonna talk through some of the options as we understand them. Uh, first up, I'll talk about coordinator with a K. Like everything else in Kubernetes, um, it comes with a custom scheduler, an admission webhook, and a daemon set running on your nodes. The interesting thing about the daemon set is that it is profiling the actual memory usage or resource utilization of your nodes, so it can really try to eke out as much usage as possible of your nodes. Um, it provides gang scheduling via the pod group API. What this means is that your pods will not be bound to nodes unless every single pod in that pod group can be bound to a node. It also provides um, additional QoS um, things for it provides custom QoSs for when Kubernetes QoSs don't suffice for whatever you're trying to do. Um, it provides quota, manage quota management as well. For that, all they're doing is they're extending the Kube scheduler Elastic Quota API with some custom annotations to help support multi-level quotas. Um, last up, they do have support for heterogeneous clusters. So if you have different types of hardware nodes or specialized nodes. They provide a device API that can be used to inform the scheduling. Um, and they also support fractional allocation of your CPUs and GPUs. The cluster auto scaling is pretty normal. They just use the inbuilt like cluster auto scaler and they don't have multi-cluster support. Um, I'm calling this out there not like as a con for coordinator. I think for most scheduler, we think for most schedulers, multi-cluster doesn't really make sense. Uh, because a cluster, a scheduler should be looking at the cluster it's operating on. Next up, I'll talk about MCAD. MCAD is a queue manager. Um, it's a controller that comes with a couple of CRDs for configuration, as well as a CRD for your actual application. Uh, the CRD is called App Wrapper. Um, our App Wrapper's operate is that you take whatever workload you want MCAD to queue for you, and you just they copy paste that into like the app wrapper format. The app wrapper just contains a little bit of additional information that is used for scheduling. Um, this provides you with a lot of flexibility, right? Um, as a user or as someone trying out a new technology, you don't have to update MCAD. All you have to do is give it the right RBAC to operate on this new CRD and then you're good to go. Um, one possible point of friction here though is that as a user, I may be familiar with upstream CRs, and now I have to make changes to my processes to work with MCAD. MCAD provides all the core things you care about with queuing, so preemption, borrowing, priorities, gang scheduling. Um, it also provides multi-level quotas, and it uses Kubernetes extended resources for dealing with you know, specialized hardware requirements. It supports auto-scaling via the machine set or machine pool APIs on OpenShift. And it does have multi-cluster support, which, and as a queuing system, it's more able to um, talk to other clusters. Next up, I'll talk about Volcano. I'm sure most people here have heard of Volcano. Um, it's a custom scheduler, which has a controller and some admission webhooks. Um, it does, it is a little interesting or different in that it also has its own job APIs, um, which for the most part, I just bought template specs with some additional 
scheduling related metadata. Um, this is, they have a lot of community integrations as well. So, you know, Kubri, Spark, Kubeflow, they all have volcano related integrations built in. And I'm sure there's a much longer list. Um, they support all the core things you care about with queuing. Um, I, the one thing I'd probably call out is that they use custom APIs in Volcano. I should pick this over. Um, they use custom APIs for the most part for everything. These APIs are pretty comparable to what's in community, but it's in the Volcano umbrella. Um, they have quota management as well. It's single level quotas. And um, one interesting thing they do do with quotas is that you can have proportional queues or quotas. What this means is that you can allocate 30% of a cluster to a quota, and as the cluster scales up and down, that queue will also automatically get readjusted. It uses Kubernetes extended resources for the, again, heterogeneous clusters, and it's also Numa aware, so you can um, do more fine-grained allocation with your CPUs. It supports auto-scaling via the cluster auto-scaler, and um, I think there was a talk today, earlier today, actually, about multi-cluster support uh, where it's delegating to external projects. Um, the last custom schedule I'll talk about is Unicorn. Unicorn can be deployed in two different ways, as a standalone or as a plugin to the Kubernetes scheduler, but the end result's the same. You're really updating the behavior of your scheduling. Um, it comes with a controller and some admission webhooks. It operates on any um, pods, and the main thing it's doing is like it's making sure that any incoming pods get transformed and the scheduler is set to refer to Unicorn. It provides all the core queuing capabilities that you care about. Um, one interesting thing that they're doing in it actually is placeholder pods. So when you have a job or workload waiting for admission, Unicorn will start creating uh, placeholder pods on your nodes to start reserving resources. The minute you have enough placeholder pods on the nodes for the workload to actually run, it mutates those pods into the actual workload, and you've basically got like a guaranteed execution at that point. For quota management, they have a custom language and configuration paths. Um, they also do the same thing for RBAC. It's interesting, right? Like it's a, it diverges a little bit from Kubernetes, but it also lets you do some things that normal Kubernetes RBAC doesn't let you do. It supports Kubernetes um, extended resources, and it works with the cluster order scaler as well. Lastly, I'll talk about Q. Um, Q comes with a number of CRDs related to configuration. Um, it operates on a predefined set of CRDs, which means that if you want to start queuing a new type of workload with queue, you're, gonna, you're going to have to make code changes, both in queue as well as in like whatever upstream CR you want to support. Um, the benefit, though, to this approach is that as a user, you really don't have to do much. If I'm used to submitting normal PyTorch jobs, just continue doing that, and if queue's running, whether it's not running, doesn't really affect me beyond you know, queuing capabilities coming in. It provides all the core queuing capabilities that we care about, and um, it's also extensible using the admission check API. So for instances where we find that queue doesn't meet your needs, you can just create a custom plugin for it. It provides quota management. The quota management only has two levels of quotas, and it allows you to share between quotas and all of that fun stuff. Um, for heterogeneous clusters, they provide a resource flavor API that is also used for scheduling. So you can submit a workload saying, hey, I want A, B, and C resources, and uh, Q will make sure that the right, taints, the right tolerations and node selectors are applied to your workload as it gets submitted. It uh, provides um, auto-scaling capabilities via the CA cluster auto-scaler provisioning request API, and they just recently introduced alpha support for multi-clusters. Um, that's the end of our slides, but like, I'm sure you can guess at this point that we've gone with Q as a solution. Um, as we were looking at the job schedulers options out there, custom schedulers pretty much immediately went out of the window due to the fact that you have a really wide impact, right? Like you're changing default customer cluster behavior for scheduling. A lot of customers would just laugh us out of the room at that point. Um, 
while we were looking at the two, these two queue managing solution, solutions, we went with Q with a K since there is minimal impact on users for adoption. With MCAD, we have more flexibility, but having to adopt a new CR introduces another barrier to entry for people who you know, want to do things with minimal effort. Um, well, yeah, that's all we had. Do we have any questions? Uh, thank you for your uh, talk. Uh, my question is that if in uh, all of these uh, schedulers, uh, queue things, uh, I might be missing uh, something, but uh, is there any of them that uh, predict the um, workload? How, how much, for example, time does it need uh, to complete on, on the workload, not on the node itself? So because it, it's uh, a common practice in uh, scheduling, uh, and I want to see if there is any specific things for AI. Uh, in this term, like AI workloads. So if, if your question is about like providing an ETA for a, a job, like um, um, at the moment, uh, at least as far as I know, they don't provide some, such an information given that um, they run like arbitrary workload and, and they, they don't have the knowledge about what is being actually scheduled or queue. On the other end, you have some project that provide some visibility on, on, on the queue, like the position of the job in the queue, et cetera. I think that's the next step actually for this project, like to, um, to provide those kind of like, um, how, how we could call it like, uh, like intelligent metrics, but uh, based on, because it, it, they would have to learn about um, the, the workload they are managing basically. Some are like um, be able to capture some insight of them and be able to like doing some even you know, the same kind of, of stuff that you do with time series forecasting or stuff like that. You try to like find similarities and, and then you can provide some, some estimate. Um, but at the moment, this is a separate concern as far as I, I see it. But it's generally a, a typical request that we have from end user. Like from, so this project generally, they have like two personas, like you have the platform administrator, the one that operates the, um, the project and generally, you really want to make sure the platform is stable, you have a good throughput, and, and, and that is basically what IKEA was about. But then you have the actual end user, like the data scientist or whoever is submitting job. And then uh, that kind of metric, the, this is the metrics they really care about, like on their own, for their own job. Well, I think we're at time as well. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you.